Fights Now, I'm Dustin Baker. It's the day after free agency edition. Here's what happened yesterday. I know it was important, critical to record a show like this on the first day of free agency, um, but there was just no segue to jump on a YouTube show and say, here's everything that happened because it was so fluid. So I opted to wait till today to cover the events of yesterday, day one of the legal tampering period. And it was eventful for the Vikings for two major reasons, which you'll see on the screen, and then um, other sentimental ties of free agents heading elsewhere. So <clears throat> I guess the spoiler is, is they're all right there. If that's all you need to see, you can either read those, look at tweets from around the Vikings community, read some of my stuff on Vikings territory, and be done. <clears throat> but this is is and forever will be the video aspect of the enterprise where I kind of explain the transactions from my perspective. Perhaps you agree, perhaps you won't. If you do not or you do, you can always uh, type in the comments your thoughts. I like reading those. <clears throat> but let's start off. These are in no order of importance, but by my estimation, there were seven items that were critical to Vikings history, Vikings offseason, and so forth. The first was Eric Kendricks to the Los Angeles Chargers. Two years, $13.25 million, which means he emphatically will not return to the Vikings in 2023. We already knew that. A week ago, he was released. He said goodbye. The team said goodbye. So he wasn't coming back, but he landed in a predictable spot. Uh, last weekend on VikingsTerritory.com, I wrote about five possible landing spots for Kendricks. And the, Car the Cardinals were my front runner. The Chargers were number three. And Broncos were in there as well, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I can't remember the other one off the top of my head. But in retrospect now, it was number three on my list, and it's number one in his heart. Uh, he went to UCLA. The L.A. part of that equates to the L.A. Chargers. And then a man named Jeff Howard was a Vikings defensive coach for a handful of years, overlapped with Kendricks' tenure. And now Mr. Howard is the inside linebackers coach for, you guessed it, the Los Angeles Chargers. So geographically, it was a fit for Kendricks, who gets to go home to his collegiate stomping grounds and reunites with Jeff Howard, who you might not know too much about, but he is the linebackers coach for the Chargers. So, and I think with Drew Tranquil, not sure if that pronunciation is correct, with he as a free agent from the Chargers, who can sign anywhere in the world right now, Kendricks taking his spot means that Kendricks will probably get some starting action and get a chance at some career rejuvenation. In 2020, uh, 2019 and 2020, Kendricks was absolutely phenomenal. 2019, he was really at the peak of his powers. And then started to tail off a little bit in 2021 and 2022. It was almost as if in 2020, before that game against Jacksonville, I think it was, he got hurt. It was almost as if that like marked the end of Dominic Kendricks. There was probably no direct correlation between the injury and you know his eventuality on the field. But like in that moment, that you know the last time that was really when Kendricks was at the at a mountaintop. Now he's good, but he's not as great or all pro like he was in 2019. So Kendricks is off the board. He's going to the AFC. Another dude, number two on the list, is going to the AFC. Patrick Peterson, future Hall of Famer in my estimation. We'll see if he's a first balloter. He's going to the Steelers, playing with Mike Tomlin, a former Vikings coach. Uh, Bryant McFadden is Patrick Peterson's cousins, and those two <clears throat> host a podcast together called All Things Covered. It's a great show. You check it out. And McFadden has strong ties. He played in the NFL for the Steelers. So I don't know if he chirped in his ear and said, homie, go to go to Pittsburgh. Uh, Peterson said that he wanted to go to a contender. And in fact, uh, yesterday before the free agent festivities kicked off, he nominated the Bengals, Cowboys, and Eagles as landing spots that intrigued him. And then he swerves and goes to the Steelers. So it's up to you to decide if the Steelers are a Super Bowl contender. We know they won't be bad. <clears throat> They're never bad. They're kind of like the Vikings. They never fully rebuild. They just stay relevant with hopes on breaking on through. Now the difference is the Steelers do break through and win Super Bowls, and, you know, this team doesn't do that. We don't do that here. Hopefully someday. But Peterson, yeah, he'll get a shot in Tomlin's defense, and depending on Kenny Pickett's development, who looked pretty damn good last year, I don't know if they're a Super Bowl contender because you'd have to theoretically get through the Chiefs, the Bills, the Ravens if Lamar goes back there, and the Bengals, of course, who Peterson called out. But he goes to the Steelers. Uh, it's noteworthy because, by my count, about seven times 
in the last three or four months, Peterson said on his show or to Chris Thomason of the Pioneer Press, I want to come back to the Vikings. And then now that's not happening. So somewhere between the negotiations, something hit a snag. I don't know that it was the Steelers can pay him a lot more money. I think he's getting two years, $14 million. Vikings probably could have afforded that. Or if they believe that at age, what's he going to be, 33 this summer? Maybe this is the end of the line, and they're trying to do the Belichick thing where they get out one year too early rather than one year too late. That's speculative. I'm not sure. But he's not coming to the Vikings. That's the, no, uh, the newsworthy item. The next one. This one, this one hurts. This is probably the most damning news event from yesterday is Dalvin Tomlinson on a chunky contract, four years, $57 million, is heading to the Cleveland Browns. Stefanski land. Those two never overlapped in Minnesota, but in your heart, Stefanski was the offensive coordinator, a, a brilliant one, in 2019. The last time the Vikings won a playoff game was a Stefanski. He jettisoned to the Browns, what, three years ago now? And now Dalvin Tomlinson will go there as well. The Browns' defense, rush defense, excuse me, was putrid in 2022. It ranked 28th per defensive DVOA, DVOA on the ground. So they had to spend big to go get a run stuffer, and Tomlinson is exactly that. He's also an adept pass rusher at times, considering how, how big of a human he is, a nose tackle-ish guy. So now for, what was it, $14 million per year? Tomlinson will go to the Browns, another team you could argue is a playoff team, I guess, if Watson is the pristine, non-scandalous version of himself from 20, pick a year, 2019, then yeah, the Browns can make some noise. Um, otherwise, Stefanski will probably be on the hot seat if they, they don't make any progress this year. Nevertheless, the Vikings lose Tomlinson in the middle of defense, which brings to prominence and importance his position. Uh, Kyrus Tonga was signed in February for an incredibly affordable deal. I'm not sure if they trust him to be a player on the interior defensive line or if they're going to draft Brian Breesey or if they're going to sign like a Jerry Tillery or Sheldon Rankins. There's other defensive tackles out there, but Tomlinson it, leaving the Vikings is a gut punch because that guy is about as consistent as they get. He doesn't have bad games. He's never really elite, but he's always damn good. So uh, that one hurts. Uh, the next one is Jordan Hicks. Restructured. The details weren't immediate, uh, immediately available, at least by the time I started recording this show, but I'm going to guess they're going to shave off $1.5 or $2 million from his deal. He evaluated the lay of the land for off-ball linebackers and said, well, my best fit is probably here with the Vikings. Uh, you can check out my homie Yannick Eckhart. He wrote about... Uh, how this can work with Hicks and Flores and how he actually likes the, the move because most of us, this guy included, believed that Hicks was on the chopping block because you could have saved $5 million by cutting him out. Right, but he'll be back, and I'll say this probably for the next six months, that if Hicks is the guy who's going to start opposite Brian Asamoah for the Vikings linebacking core, that's fine because Brian Flores is in charge, and Brian, Brian Flores' thing is linebackers. So if he trusts Hicks and Asamoah, I'm going to guess there's a method to the madness. Still, Minnesota could sign any off-the-wall linebacker from free agency. There's still a ton out there. Or in the NFL draft, Drew Sanders is interesting, and Trenton Simpson, who Josh Fry always talks about. He'll be on tomorrow. Not Simpson, Fry will. Uh, yeah, you have options at off-ball linebacker. You don't have to be pigeonholed into thinking Hicks has to be the guy. Um, but Flores, linebackers, that's his niche. They should be in good hands. Hicks looks to be back starting opposite Ryan Asamoah, at least as of March 14th. The next one for the finally getting finally with the old the, the former player stuff. Cameron Dantzler goes to the Commanders. That was a straight up waiver wire pickup. Dantzler had a very odd Vikings career as a rookie. He looked like a cornerback that the Vikings had finally hit on. He was going to be good, and he, sh he some, there were some times Dantzler looked great. They're like this guy's progressing. He's a little he's a little slender build, but who cares? And there are other times where he would just look terrible. Uh, most notably, the end of that 2021 Lions game on the road at Ford Field. Uh, there was a lot of bad shit that season. But Dantzler was hot and cold with the Vikings. He also had that marvelous strip steal of a fumble from Amir Smith-Marset to win the Bears game last year. And so, yeah, it, it's really sad to see Dantzler go, not because, of, like, oh, what are we going to do without him? But, you know, he was the one cornerback that really worked out in the last 
five draft classes. And saying he worked out is a gift, but it was compared to the rest who flamed out, like uh, Mike Hughes, Jeff Gladney. Um, there's a bunch. So now he'll go to the Commanders. Uh, <laughs> this is funny. Yannick Eckhart pointed this out to me in a, in a private message that the Vikings, remember those team, those team report cards that came out, what, two weeks ago? Vikings were the top with an A-plus, baby. Well, Dancer's going to the team with the F-minus. So he goes from a culture that, in theory, should have been able to cultivate him to, yikes, the Washington, who eh, we shall see. Uh, I'm not too sure if Dantzler takes off. I hope he does uh, because, you know, he was, he was a lovable dude. But he was mysteriously benched down the stretch of two seasons in a row, uh, one for Bashad Breeland, which very odd, and then, of course, Duke Shelley, who played like Deion Sanders, uh, took his job last year after the injury. It's a long way of saying the Vikings cornerback room is thin. My goodness. It's Andrew Booth, a Caleb Evans, Kalan, uh, Kalan Barnes, and – or maybe it's Kalen Barnes, I don't know. And Tay Gowan, that's four guys, none of whom you'd trust to start week one if the season started on Sunday. Now, Andrew Booth, Caleb Evans can show up and have absolutely fantastic summers, training camps, preseasons. Great, we'll take it. But we don't know that for sure. Therefore, uh, because Patrick Peterson is not coming back – Dantzler isn't even on the roster anymore. He's a commander. We're unsure of Duke Shelley. Everybody's on Duke Shelley watch. We don't have any viable starting corners unless you wholeheartedly believe Booth is ready or Evans is ready. That's panic mode for an NFL that pass, passes all the damn time. So they better get their ducks in a row and find some cornerbacks. And I'm talking like two at least of guys that you can trust. And especially you got to find a slot guy too. So the cornerback situation is grim right now, although it's only day two of free agency at the time of this YouTube show's publication. So a lot of stuff can change and will change, but the Vikings need cornerback help. You can circle that and highlight it in yellow and do whatever it is you want to do to it. Rounding out the show, the new guys, the stuff, the big news. Uh, Josh Oliver, uh, blocking, run blocking primarily, also pass blocking tight end from the Baltimore Ravens, is the new man on the Minnesota Vikings. Now, this was a stunner for many because if you looked at the Vikings roster needs, what, a week ago, two weeks ago, you'd see offensive tackle and be like, nope, we're good. Brian O'Neill, Christian Derrissaw, don't need nada. And tight end, we're fine. We got like four dudes, TJ Hawkinson, Nick Muse, Ben Ellison, and who am I forgetting? Oh, no, it was just those three. And the fourth is now Josh Oliver. So, you know, and he got a, he got a hefty deal per average annual salary. Um, when you pull back the curtain on the deal, it's really team-friendly. It's a lot like Zadarius Smith's last year in terms of the vibe. The sticker shock is like, what? You spent blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's a team-friendly deal for Oliver. And evidently, Kevin O'Connell said, in my offense, we're going to need a guy – you know, who can block and Hawkinson can do that, but he's not good at that acumen as Oliver. So I think Oliver, because he was the first free agent signing of the cycle, was it early yesterday afternoon? People were like, what the hell? This is the one thing we didn't need. I think when you calm down and you get to about week four of next season, which would be early October, you're going to be like, ah, that's why they signed this guy. Because A, he's a pretty good tight end, and then B, he does the intangible or the dirty stuff that nobody really cares about because we're so obsessed with fantasy football and Madden. Uh, blocking matters, folks, and uh, there's no other way to, to put it. All right, the big news. So there's this trend by the new front office, and we'll, we'll have to document it for next year. They make their big move, Quasi Dafa Mensa, Kevin O'Connell, they make their big free agent addition the night of the first night of free agency. Last year at about 7.30 p.m., March 14th, 2022, bada bing, they signed Harrison Phillips from the Buffalo Bills. That was their big signing on the defensive line. They waited a week and then signed Zadaria Smith after that. And then about the same time last night, about 8.30 or so, Marcus Davenport from New Orleans Saints joined the Vikings. And that came out of nowhere. Uh, he was, according to Pro Football Focus, the top edge rusher on the market. And because he was that, and the Vikings were incredibly cash-strapped, or still incredibly cash-strapped, you look at Davenport's name on the free agency list, and we're like, yeah, well, he's a saint. He's not coming to the Vikings. And lo and behold, it happened. Uh, the guy is 26 years old. It's a one-year, $13 million dollar deal for Davenport. <clears throat> and unless something wonky happens where Zarius Smith rescinds his goodbye tweet, 
it'll be Marcus Davenport and Daniil Hunter formulating the 2023 edge department. And if Davenport's performance over the last five years is a reasonable indicator, it should be about the same between Hunter and Davenport. Zedarius was a ghoulishly good edge rusher for the first nine, 10 weeks of 2022. And then the sack numbers, which everybody loves to point at, trended down. The pressures were still there. And this is kind of, it's kind of similar now because Marcus Davenport, there's a junior debate going on about if he's any good because he only registered a half sack last year, which is not good. Uh, but the pressure and the pressure rate was there. And he's freakishly athletic. He's also a run stopper. And then he has the, the physical tools to be an elite pass rusher. I uh, will ask Josh Fry about him tomorrow, but Josh Fry was lukewarm on the signing. Uh, he says Saints fans usually criticize Davenport's durability and consistency, and we'll hear him out on that. And if you pull up Davenport's uh, PFF resume, it's just wonderful. It's nothing below 70 ever, a couple 80-something years in there. And he, by the metrics, he looks like a consistent defender. So we'll get Josh Fry's take on that tomorrow. But the big signing, and I don't know if anything will outdo this, maybe a cornerback, maybe we'll get lucky there for the Vikings 2023 free agency is Marcus Davenport because that fell out of the sky. He's a bona fide uh, defensive end. And it's another move that affirms that although Kirk Cousins may not be extended, the Vikings are in this thing to again to win it in 2023. Now, uh, the way that they're, they have sculpted the offseason so far, getting rid of Thielen, getting rid of Hicks, yes, they're going to have ample cap space in 2024, especially if Cousins isn't extended. But there's this false notion that's going around that like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to mail it in for 2023 to get ready for 2024. That isn't happening. That's what you want to happen. There's a lot of people that desperately want Kirk Cousins off the team. So they formulated this new idea that, well, it ain't 2023. That's that's it. It's 2024 is the holy grail with this quarterback. Nobody even knows who it's going to be or his name. So we'll talk a lot about that this offseason because I'm going to guess that talker will not stop its proliferation. But it's silly. Uh, 2023 is just as vital as 2024 for Vikings football because otherwise – you don't sign Marcus Davenport. You don't look to keep Justin Jefferson in house if you're going to do some rebuild that Kwesi Dafa emphatically says that he doesn't support. He supports a competitive rebuild, and the competitive part of a competitive rebuild is signing guys like Marcus Davenport to one-year deals. All right, we'll be back tomorrow with Josh Fry to get his take on two days' worth of free agency and more throughout the week. Uh, this is one of the most exciting weeks in the NFL calendar, bar none, and I'm excited to talk to you guys and gals about it for the rest of the week. Skull, baby.